Major funding for these programs is made possible by grants from Chase Commercial Term Lending, New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, M&T Bank, Customers Bank, Genova Burns, Terra CRG, Meridian Capital Group, Wickhoff Organization. Additional support is made possible by AKA Hotels Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Colliers International NYC, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Eastern Union Funding, Fisher Brothers, First Nationwide Title Agency, Flushing Bank, Friedman, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investments, Hersha Hospitality, Hodges Ward Elliott, Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, New Banks, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, The Continuum Company, The Moynian Group, and these friends. Poughkeepsie, New York. I had radio at high school. Colgate, now I'm going to go to Syracuse. Nah, it's time to go in the military. Interesting career. You know what? I like radio. Radio is an opportunity. But no, there's something called television. And I'm going to get involved with television. I'm not going to get involved with television. I'm going to be involved with NBC. I'm going to be involved with PB, public broadcasting. I'm going to be involved with NET. Now I'm also going to be produce major shows, the Great American Dream Team, Adam Smith, Peabody Awards, Emmy Awards. I have Al Perlmutter. Thanks for being here. We have nothing more to discuss. I know. I try to do it in the abridged <laughs> one-minute version. So tell me about uh, the, your great-grandparents when they came over in 1890. Well, the furthest back that I've been able to get any family history is about 125 years ago. And to the best of my knowledge, my grandfather, as a uh, teenager, uh, came over in the 18, early 1890s from Austria-Hungary. You told me a great story about the, the, the money. I don't know whether Ellis Island was functioning at that time, but the story is, and I believed everything my, grandma, my grandfather told me, um, but when he arrived at the New York port, he had to show that he had some financial responsibility so he wouldn't be on the dole when he entered America. So before they went to the officials, someone was there to rent him a roll of bills. And then he showed it to the officials. They said, okay, you've got financial responsibility. And when he left the officials, went out the other door, he gave the roll back to an associate of the guy he rented it from. So that's, that's the story. So he comes over and he gets into what the... Uh Fruit and vegetables later on? Well, he had a cousin in Poughkeepsie. He went as far as Poughkeepsie. That's as far as the money would take him. And uh, he started a uh, fruit and vegetable cart, which eventually worked up to a... With the horse. Eventually two horses. Then after several years, he decided to go into the dry goods business, linens, that sort of thing. And that's what he did. And eventually, after years of that, with my grandmother... They started a, uh, and my father, they started a furniture store. Which we have photos of. So tell me about grandma, the other side. Well, my paternal grandmother was from Poland. And she's the only grandparent I really knew because I, uh, the others had died before. They came to New York City? No, they came to uh, Poughkeepsie. 
they had relatives there. I, I don't know too much about hers. Okay, so it was 1929, an auspicious time that your grandfather and your father started a, uh, a furniture. furniture business, right? And which subsequently became two furniture stores, right? Well, they had one in the main section of Poughkeepsie and another near Vassar College, yes. Tell me about growing up as a kid in Poughkeepsie. It was great. It was a small town, 60,000 people, uh, all kinds of mixtures. There were Italian, uh, Polish, um, Irish, uh, African-American, Jewish, a whole range of people. We just, it was a community that, that worked very well together. When you were young, what were you interested in doing? In high school, I got a job at the local radio station, WKIP, a 250-watt station. And my job there was to get up very early in the morning and rip the news off the ticker and read it, and then throw a switch that would put the network newscast on the air. And I enjoyed that during high school days. So from high school, you weren't too far from Colgate, and you right. applied to Colgate. But you said to me, Colgate was fine, but at that time there were a lot of the v, uh, GI benefits, people right. coming back from the war, and the environment wasn't the appropriate that you wanted to change? It was a great environment for studying, but as you know, when you're a college student, studying is not the end all and be all of being in college. So you go to Syracuse, which was an interesting place, and you also had a lot of military people at Syracuse. Well, I found, I found myself going to Syracuse every other week to visit, and eventually I transferred, yes. So you're at Syracuse, and that's when you get involved with radio again. I did. Syracuse, although it didn't have a, a, a radio or television course of any sort, it had a, an FM radio station, a two-and-a-half-watt FM station behind the library in a Quonset hut. And, and I became a member of the senior staff there. And let's talk about the broadcast that was for NBC radio. On oh, the, that. The fishing. Now, what happened was uh, there were several members of us who were the senior staff, and we were always trying to think of provocative, interesting, new programming to do. And the uh, Ampex quarter-inch tape machines had just come out, the studio size, they were about this big. And uh, one of our student engineers said, why don't we do a remote with that? We said, where are you going to plug it in? He said, I'll work it up with the batteries and we'll put them in the car trunk. So a fellow student of mine uh, and I put together an idea that it was April, the beginning of the fishing season. We'd go out about 20 miles outside of Syracuse and interview some fishermen and do a stand-up and bring it back, put it on the air. The night before we went out, we got a call from WSYR, the NBC radio station. And they said that the Morgan Beatty Show in New York, a network news show, very well known, uh, was heard about our plans and they wanted to take a feed. So we looked at each other and said, absolutely, let's, let, let, let's do it. So about 4.30 the next morning, we pile in a car, the batteries and the tape recorder in the trunk, we go out, I put on hip boots, go out into the stream, interview fishermen by a waterfall, and then we come back to the uh, radio shack where our studio was, put the tape on the machine, and I sounded like Donald Duck because the batteries obviously weren't functioning properly. Well, the other student who happened to be Bill Sapphire, later of New York Times fame, and I looked at each other, and Bill, without saying anything to me, put a new tape on the machine, and I, without saying anything to him, I took an extended cord to the men's room, turned on the water, and I did a stand-up. We then fed it to WSYR and to NBC, and that was our network debut. Years later, I want to say, we fully divulged everything. We told the truth. We told the truth. So it's now 1949. You're graduating Syracuse. And what do you decide to do before the military picks up? When I had worked at this local small station in Poughkeepsie during high school, the manager of that station decided to start his own station, and he invited me to join him. So WEOK went on the air right after I graduated from college, and um, in 1949, and uh, I was the newscaster, the disc jockey, the salesperson, and promotion writer. And it was a good experience. And I, you know. And then the military calls. It's and a year later, I was drafted. Yes. So, so I, and you were infantry and the Signal Corps? I started out in infantry, had a full infantry training, 
And then when they saw in my resume that I worked in broadcasting, they put me in the Signal Corps, which meant that I learned the art of climbing telephone poles and stringing wire. So how does Al then get into officer's training? Well, at one point, I wasn't quite pleased with my progress or, let's say, my potential in, in the military. So I went to officer's training school in Fort Riley, Kansas, came out a first lieutenant. And then, because of my broadcast experience, I found myself as radio TV officer for the First Army area. First Army constitutes the eight northeastern states. So my office was at 90 Church Street in New York. My barracks were on Governor's Island. And during that time, I had an opportunity to uh, interact with network people. And, uh, you know, uh, one of the uh, highlights of that period was, I think it was 1953. Uh, it was the Korean conflict, it was just ending. And um, there were about 3,600 prisoners, U.S. prisoners, who were being repatriated or brought back as part of an exchange called Operation Big Switch. So I arranged with the Goodson Todman organization, which was, had then had programs like uh, I've Got a Secret, What's My Line, and so on. I arranged with them to bring the first American soldier who was brought back to be on their show. So I met him at then Idlewild Airport, now JFK, in a limo. And while he was, he had been freed from Korea the day before. And while we were going into the city, he changed from his uniform into his civilian suit. I brought him to the Goodson Todman studio, and he was a guest on uh, I've, Got a Secret. I've Got a Secret. And um, it worked out very well. But so with the, the military is over. You have radio, you have a TV from Goodson Todman. What happens next? Uh, while I was working in the New York area, I got to know Texan Jinx who were the couple on broadcasting in, in New York. And they had a morning radio show from their home in Manhasset, an afternoon television show from 67th and Columbus, and a late night talk show, uh, a la Charlie Rose, from Peacock Alley in uh, the Waldorf. And a bunch of us, very hardworking, low paid people, got jobs with them working on all three shows every day. And from that, the folks at local NBC offered me a job as assistant to the news and public affairs person there. And uh, eventually when he left, I took over as head of news and public affairs for NBC local television and radio. Right, it was originally RCA. RCA, right. And then it became WNBC. That's right. So now, now, it's, now you have NBC and then there's an opportunity, there's this new idea of public broadcasting, right? What happens? <laughs> Well, after several years, about eight years at NBC, NBC Local, and by the way, in the interim, I had been bumped up to program manager, a very young 29-year-old uh, program manager for Channel 4. Um, I left with a friend. We started our own company. And uh, we were doing uh, commercial work, institutional work, films, and so on. And I got a call from a man by the name of Jack White, who had recently gotten money from the Ford Foundation to start a broadcast organization called National Educational Television. And its function was to provide programming for the roughly 80 public television stations in the country at the time. And he said, I want somebody who has done documentaries in commercial broadcasting to do it now for public broadcasting. At that time, they called it educational broadcasting. And would you be interested? And I saw opportunities there, and I grabbed onto it. When we got together, you were telling me about in order to get the the shows around, you had to have make 40 DV. Yes. What happened is that um, <clears throat> there were roughly 80 stations, and there were no connecting cables with those stations. So we made 40 copies of every weekly half-hour documentary and sent them out to the first 40 stations. They would air them. We'd send them out on a Saturday night. They'd air them on the following Monday or Tuesday. Then they would take those tapes and bicycle them to another 40 stations. So the shows that we did had to have at least a two-week shelf life. And our programs were all on current affairs, 
magazine style, so they, they lasted a while. Now, there was one very interesting thing when Kennedy was shot. Oh, yes. So tell me that story. It was a Friday afternoon, of course, and I had a program in the can ready to be duplicated, but it had Jack Kennedy on it. And when the assassination took place, once we got over the initial shock, uh, we realized we had a show we couldn't air. And I didn't know what to do because I had a show that was due on the air the following week. So I realized that the networks were covering the assassination and the upcoming funeral to a fairly well. And we did not have the resources or ability to cover it the way they did. So I took a couple of uh, uh, my friends and we went down to Austin, Texas, and I did a show about the next president of the United States, LBJ. So we spent the next 48 hours filming and taping a half hour program, a profile of Lyndon Johnson from his home in Johnson City, Austin, friends and so on. And then I, by private plane, I flew it up to uh, the, um, the um, distribution organization and we got it out on time. So now you're at a NET for a number of years doing documentaries and magazine type of things. You get a phone call from a friend to go back to NBC? Yes, it was after the Great American Dream Machine. Okay, so the Great American Dream Machine was first. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about it. the Great American Dream Machine celebrating its close to 45th anniversary this year. Yeah. Came out in 1971. Many people have said that that was the precursor to Saturday Night Live. How do you and this, your friend Jack Willis, okay, come up with the satirical idea of a show, a magazine show, 90 minutes with no hosts, with people like Chevy Chase, Blaze Star, and everything. How did that come about? You have to understand the premise of then educational, now public television. And that was to be, that was to be an alternative to commercial television. We had no commercials. We had no government interference. We had nothing but our imaginations and a few bucks to work with. And our charge was to uh, engage people, to amuse them, to inform them, to provoke them, to uh, anger them in some ways, and to come up with something interesting. So at the invitation of the then Bill Coben, who was then Vice President of Programming at NET, I gathered the producers together in an organization, and we started noodling, brainstorming ideas. We came up with the idea of a magazine program that would be three hours in length every Wednesday night, and it would combine public affairs, cultural affairs, and so on. And I've always wanted to erase the line between public and cultural affairs, because so much of what we do in art reflects what's happening in, in, the, in the culture, in the, uh, in, in the public affairs. So um, public uh, NET couldn't afford three hours. We finally negotiated down to 90 minutes and uh, put a tag on it called Great American Dream, which was an umbrella under which we could fit so many things. And to my surprise, people started coming in the door. Faye Dunaway, uh, Joe Bologna, Renee Taylor, uh, yes, and... Uh, you had Chevy Chase Chevy. with the opening of the two uh, mannequins, right? That's right. You also were um, picked on by the FBI and by the Nixon uh, White House. Tell me about that. Well, the show, for those who weren't familiar with it, who are too young, uh, <clears throat> consisted of uh, a number of segments, each eight to ten minutes long, roughly. And some of them were documentaries, some of them were uh, dr dramatic, dramatic, some of them were um, uh, musical, and so on. And or commentary, Andy Rooney, for example, uh, worked uh, on it for two years. One of our segments had to do with uh, agent provocateurs who were um, working for the FBI, who were getting people to plan to plant bombs, and so on. And uh, the FBI was not pleased with the fact that we were about to air that because I had sent a letter to J. Edgar Hoover saying, here's what we're planning to do. I couldn't show him a clip, but I quoted from the program and I invited him to come on the show. I got a letter, which I regret I do not have now. Uh, I got a letter back from him saying he wouldn't honor the program by responding or being on the air. 
and um, uh, all hell broke loose. And, and Nixon in the Vietnam yeah, War? Yeah. yeah, what happened was that the PBS, or the national broadcasters decided at the point they didn't want to air that segment. And um, as a result, that segment was taken off for the moment. But two weeks later, we had a full program of discussion in which the, pro the segment was aired. So that's the way public television was working. So Great American last two years, the first year was 90 minutes, the second year due, due to financial hour. was one hour over there. And then you get a phone call back from your friends at NBC? Uh, yes, NBC had decided to have a new post, vice president of news in charge of documentaries. And they asked if I was interested. And I went over and we talked. And I was happy doing what I was doing, although I had pretty much burned out on the dream machine. I was not, uh, it, was, it was a lot of work and uh, I was tired. So um, I was advised by my various mentors in the, in the industry to take the job at NBC. And one of them was Bill Sapphire, right? No, one of them was Fred Friendly. Fred Friendly. And the other was Mike Dan from uh, CBS. And um, uh, Bill was then doing Nixon's work and so on. Um, but uh, the, the, the advice that they gave me was, you won't want to last there long, but you'll have an audience that you've never had before, and you'll have budgets that you've never had before. Correct. And as a result, uh, I inherited a, I, I, I gathered together a staff of 60 on the 12th floor at 30 Rock. And uh, for a few years, I, I ran the documentary thing. So now it's what, 74, 75? 74, 75, 76, 77, yeah. Okay, and then you decide to go back onto the production line yes, again. Yes, yes. Commercial television, is not public television. And public television offers, at least someone like me anyway, an opportunity that you just don't get anyplace else. So I went back into it and uh, started producing independently with my own company. Right, and tell me about some of those uh, productions that you feel proud of. I think The Muslims was one. <clears throat> well, Muslims came later. The, but, the uh, Black Power, the one? Well, I tell you, things. I, I feel fortunate in a way because when I was doing that kind of work, there were some major, major things happening in this country. And the chief one was uh, civil rights. And at the time, at 67, for example, there were Newark riots. And public television had asked me to um, go and do a documentary about what was happening in Newark. And we started, and we started filming for two days in Newark. And it, and uh, I, felt that something was wrong because all the networks were doing the same thing. And I came back and said, why don't we address the reason for the riots, which was that African Americans felt that they were not being recognized in broadcasting or in society in general the way they should be. They weren't born, they weren't married, they didn't have children, they didn't die, and so on. So I put together an idea called Black Journal. And to their credit, uh, NET came up with the money for four sample shows. One, one a month for four months, and Black Journal began. Now, after that, you also mentioned that you were involved with network TV. You did some productions for ABC, did one production. I, uh, I backslid a couple of times, yes, uh, I, uh, <clears throat> but I had fun. Uh, ABC, when they saw The Dream Machine, wanted a commercial version of it. So they funded me for a pilot program, which was one of 29 pilots that were done for ABC that season. And I called it the Perpetual People Puzzle. And I had uh, a lot of good talent on it. Uh, you know, I got Bob Klein, uh, Lee Grant, uh, Richie Havens, uh, etc. cetera. And um, it aired on ABC. It did well, but it was not selected as a series. That was fine. Yeah. Now, you also had mentioned you were involved with HBO. HBO, I did one of their first uh, comedy specials with Joe Bologna, Renee Taylor, who had worked with me at, at uh, the Great American, Great Dream, American Dream Machine. Yes. And also with HBO, uh, I had several series going at once. Uh, again, not commercial, so it was free to do. We were free to do what we felt we should be doing. 
Uh, one was with Consumer Reports magazine. That was an ongoing series about Consumer Reports items. Another was um, uh, Money magazine. And the other was a science show called uh, What on Earth? So uh, speaking of money, how do you meet the uh, Adam Smith, whose real name was George... Uh, George Goodman. George Goodman, and create another show that aired for 14 years called Adam Smith uh, That was money. a long-running show, yes. The president of Channel 13 at the time, Jay Islin, called and said his friend Jerry Goodman, who had done uh, some marvelous writing of books and reporting, uh, and who was known as Adam Smith because his editors didn't want him to be known to the... Specifically Clay Felker right, of Clay New York Felker, Magazine, right, right? Right. And he said that, uh, would I be interested in meeting Jerry Goodman and coming up with a way of putting him on television? So I did, and I designed a weekly half-hour show, which I felt was different from what else was being done at the time on uh, finances and, and money. Most shows at the time were news reports, uh, two minutes here, 30 seconds there, and so on. I decided to do a single show on a single subject, and Jerry Goodman, Adam Smith, was ideally suited for that. He was a terrific writer, had a good sense of humor. We had some early graphics. This is before the full-blown computer graphics that we know today. But we had some early graphics which were cartoon-like and gave life to the show. And in the course of it, we um, did most of the shows here in the United States, but we also went to China in Sichuan province when the phrase to become rich is beautiful is, uh, was there. And uh, we, we spent time with a uh, rich farmer uh, who kept his cow in his bedroom and so on. We um, went to Cuba when they were beginning to accept the dollar and Australia and, and other places. So... You've won a lot of Emmys, at least six. I think you won a Peabody. Uh, you won others, but your family. Tell me about your family. Your children, your wife, the grandchildren. <clears throat> well, and we need all the names because it's all part of the requirement. Okay. I have three marvelous sons, Jim, Steve, and Tom. Jim and Tom are in the financial area. Uh, Steve is a, uh, a high-tech person and working for high tech in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, my uh, second marriage uh, is to Joan Connor, whom I met at NBC. She was a producer with me uh, at, the, at the time. And Joan, as you probably know, became later the dean of the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism. And um, we've been together, what, 38 years. And grandchildren, names? We have, oh my gosh, between us we have Ten grandchildren. Good. Yeah. I want to hear them. You know. We're okay. Gonna, we're going to test you. You know. <laughs> Brian, Julia, Elana, um, uh, Drew, Austin, Tyler, Nina. On Joan's side, we have uh, Marshall and Elliot. Um, Harper. Have I missed anybody? I think you got everyone. So I'd say for from the kid from Poughkeepsie who could have been in the furniture store. Okay. Yes. You know, originally the dry goods store. Uh, you know, it was, it was fortuitous that you worked at the uh, the little radio station and had a um, fantastic career. And I can say you're a legend. And thanks for being here today. Well, thank you.